From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Samantha Lummibau and tonight we celebrate some of our top reports from our Cronkite Sports Bureau. From the efforts to keep players healthy to stories of inspiring athletes who are transforming communities. The freshman football team at most high schools often don't get a lot of time in the spotlight. But reporter Matt Lively has been on the sidelines, tracking one young player making an impact. 14-year-old Adonis Watt has spent most of his life turning heads. Now he's a freshman at Brophy High School, and he's turning more heads than ever before. But this time, it's on the football field. Football is a game of sight, a game of sound. I've been playing it almost 10 years now. I've been playing it, like I've been playing football before I was blind. Without his eyesight since age five, Adonis plays the game by listening for his defenders. His hearing is vital to his game. A game number 48 hopes to play well past high school. Right now I'm about 14, I'm going to the NFL, so probably, probably about 20, 22 more years. Adonis lost his vision suddenly one summer day while playing with friends. He was diagnosed with glaucoma a condition that damages optic nerves and can lead to blindness. For that first year, he had 11 surgeries, and age six was when he said, Mom, I don't want any more surgery because I'm not broken, and I know you're trying to fix me, but I can see you. The Watts enrolled Adonis in the elementary education program at the Foundation for Blind Children, where he learned how to read Braille and adapt to his new way of life. I knew early on Adonis was special. I knew early on that he could do anything. He could go places, and he would be willing to take the opportunities given to him. Football runs in the Watt family. Both his father and brother played, and the high school freshman wasn't going to be the outlier. When Adonis went blind, I thought, well, how is he going to win? Because, like, we win, and so what's up? <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean? We're still winning. I'm like, okay. Show me how and I'm going to be there. And he's like, Mom, I got this. He deserves the playing time that he gets. I think that's the, that's the one thing that kind of gets lost in this conversation is it's not, Adonis doesn't get any kind of charity from us on, in this football team and, and neither does he want it. Adonis is more than just an athlete, serving as a role model for younger kids with vision loss. The high schooler from Chandler has raised money for foundations and even received an invitation to the White House. I'm probably a voice. They, they probably consider me that just because all the stuff I've done and all the stuff I'm going to do. Adonis is the epitome of vision loss as a diagnosis, not a disability. He's never let his vision loss stop him from doing anything. Adonis trains hard to succeed, working out with a personal trainer every weekend. He has fire. He has, like, a great... Um, uh, Will, uh, he is really trying to uh, change his life, but in the process, he's also changing other people's lives. Where did the balls go? Top or bottom, doesn't matter. Just like on the football field, the 14-year-old doesn't get special treatment at home either. You know, he gets up, he makes his bowl of cereal, just like all my other kids, you know, he does his own thing. He's not going to be 40 years old living in my house asking me for gas money. You're not protecting them over their lifetime if you're not letting them learn and letting them do things that other kids are doing. For Adonis, the biggest of those things is football. It is through the sport that he loves so much that he hopes to impact so many. He's that little, little bit, that little something special that brings teams together that, that you always hope for. And his message to other kids who are blind is simple. Look at what I'm doing. Why can't you just say, just do you? With three more years to play at Brophy and a lifetime ahead of him, this surely won't be the last time you hear the name Adonis Watt. Adonis appeared in every single game during his freshman season and even rushed for three touchdowns. Next year, he plans on junior varsity. Matt Lively, Cronkite News. Not long after the 9-11 attacks, Pat Tillman decided to leave behind football stardom to join the U.S. Army. Today, his San Jose High School's football team plays in Peoria, visiting Arizona for the first time since Tillman's death. Cronkite News reporter Cynthia Esqueda went to Liberty High School to see how tonight's game will pay tribute to the ASU and Cardinals legend. 
I still don't see a flag. Long before oh, Pat Tillman <laughs> served in the military and played football for the Arizona Cardinals and Arizona State, he starred at San Jose's Leland High School in a stadium that now bears his name. Tillman's alma mater plays its first game in his adopted home Friday when they take on Peoria's Liberty High School. He's inspired me in the way of playing the game with tough, toughness, discipline, and leadership. Kind of inspired us to just want to be like him. Liberty coach Mark Smith reached out to Leland coach Mike Ward after learning that Tillman attended the school. Smith invited Leland to come to Peoria for the Pat Tillman Classic, honoring Tillman as well as other military and first responders. It's pretty cool. Uh, I've never played an out-of-state team before, and for it to be like a big game for the military, so my dad's in the military, it's a big deal to me. Even though Tillman died when the oldest of these players were still preschool age, his legacy has left an impact on them, not just on the field, but off of it as well. Pat Tillman inspired me to join the Navy after high school to go on and into special forces. Toughness, discipline, leadership, composure, commitment. You got to have those things when you go on in life, and you got to have those things when you go into the military branches. Smith hopes the Tillman Classic will become an annual event. In Peoria, Cynthia Esqueda, Cronkite News. Both high schools will wear camouflage uniforms in tonight's game. The uniforms will be auctioned off with proceeds going to the Pat Tillman Foundation. This past weekend, the ASU women's basketball team made the five-hour trip to Window Rock, Arizona for a matchup against number four Baylor. But for the team, this trip was about more than just a game. Reporter Anthony Totry has the story. <laughs> No expensive shoes, no perfect hoops, and sometimes no court at all. But that doesn't stop the passion for basketball for those in Window Rock, the Navajo Nation capital. If there's a basketball and a hoop, you can basically just play anywhere. This past weekend, that passion was showcased on national television as fans packed Window Rock High School's 6,500-seat gymnasium for the showdown on the res. A game between Arizona State and Baylor's teams. For many, it marked the first time they experienced Division I basketball. Although the game's significance can't be understated, it was about more than just basketball. Having them here inspires me to like go bigger, dream bigger, and just have a mindset that wherever you live, you can always achieve more than you think. It's almost like every other house has a basketball hoop out front here, and that's because basketball on the res is different than it is back in Phoenix. For many, it means everything here. Coming to this community, it's like, wow, there's a lot of kids that you're really going to impact, and having this opportunity is just amazing. The team's goal was to leave a lasting reminder that anything is possible. And if there's one piece of advice Coach Charlie Turner Thorne has for those on the res, it's to follow the path that came before them. They had a fire inside of them. They were hungry to do things that, you know, they weren't sure they could do. You know, I would tell them, you know, it's okay if you don't think you can do it, but go for it. With 5,600 in attendance and thousands of kids in the stands, the Sun Devils left those on the reservation with an experience unlike any other. In Window Rock, Anthony Totry, Cronkite News. Thank you. The Sun Devils were unable to beat the Bears, but Coach Turner Thorne believes what the team set out to be do beyond the game was accomplished. Championships are the goal for any high school football program, but sustained success brings more than just a gold trophy. Reporter Anthony Totry has the story. The Saguaro Sabre Cats are no stranger to success, winning five straight state championships with a sixth in progress. It's pretty easy just because once you have that feeling of winning a state championship, there's no feeling like it, so you, you're willing to work as hard as it, as hard as it takes to uh, um, win the other ones. As Saguaro consistently remains one of the top programs in the state, head coach Jason Mons knows what this team does for the school. You know, when you've got a good football team that's playing in big games and winning big games and there's rivalries and there's excitement, the, the students show up to support the team, they spend time together, and I think think it builds a school spirit. But a handful of championship trophies and an in-state winning streak extending years back does more than just earn fans and support. It earns money. The, the thing that people don't look at is when you have people that open enroll and come to the school from out of district, it brings more money into this district. And, and we have had a lot of kids that have come to this program from outside of our, our boundaries. Transfers are a part of any successful football program, but the contributions go beyond the field. 
when a student transfers out of district from one jersey to another, then per pupil spending comes into play, which is the amount of money allocated per student. In 2017, a report from the state government concluded that Arizona's total spending per student was $9,653. And each kid has a value over their head about how much each one is worth. While well, transfers bring in a good chunk of funds, so do the ticket sales, concessions, and other aspects of having giant crowds on Friday nights. But for the athletes, coaches, and administration, it's not always about the money. They come in, but it's not something where they just come in to get what they want. They come in and they become a part of the family almost immediately. A portion of the money does get pumped back into the program, and it's evident in Saguaro's new $2 million turf field and the renovations to the weight room over the last few years. In Scottsdale, Anthony Totry, Rockite News. With high school football playoffs right around the corner, Saguaro could rewrite history yet again if they're able to capture their sixth straight state title. If you're looking for one show that tells you what happened that day in the world of business, it's NBR. We saw a classic chipwreck. Nordstrom's opening stores. Triple digit gains. Crude climbs. We're there to help our audience find new investment ideas. The market still has room to go up. Nightly Business Report is the longest running business television program in history. Weeknights at 1030 on Arizona PBS. Join us each week on Catalyst, the show that explores new advancements, technologies, and innovations at Arizona State University that are shaping the future for tomorrow and beyond. Catalyst, Wednesdays at 9, right here on Arizona PBS. Although athlete protests have taken over headlines in the past few years, this type of activism has been making a powerful impact on sports for decades. Cronkite News reporter Justin Parm spoke to some past Olympic medalists about why the conversation has not changed. On the Mexico City Olympics podium, John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their fist in protest. In 2016, Colin Kaepernick decided to take a knee in protest. Despite almost five decades separating the events, both central figures believe their message was misinterpreted. They changed the scenario from the Olympic Project for Human Rights and made it a black power movement. Just like Mr. Kaepernick said, I'm concerned about police brutality. They changed the scenario on that said he's unpatriotic, he's against the flag, he's against the military. After their display, Carlos and Smith were asked to leave the game. But just as other NFL players have decided to take a knee with Kaepernick, Carlos and Smith were not the only ones to demonstrate at the games. And I wore black shorts throughout the Olympic Games. That was my protest. We go and win these medals. They put us up on the pedals to, oh, look, they did for the USA. And we come back and we have no rights. After winning the gold medal in the uh, relay, we, I dedicated my medals to Tommy and Carlos for what they did on their victory stand. For many, it's hard to believe that 50 years after John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their fists in protest, we're still having the conversation around race. But for some, this conversation will never end. I gave a lecture before about 450 largely white Americans, and I asked them, how many of you feel somewhat uncomfortable uncomfortable or a great deal uncomfortable about athletes taking a knee and about three-fourths of the hands went up I, then i asked them how many of you would trade places with african americans not a single hand went up so they understand the message they simply refuse to deal with it because it is so tied up with their identity their privilege and their power and they don't want to discuss that. Even though great strides have been made to repair race relations in the United States, there is still work to be done. In Phoenix, Justin Parm, Cronkite News. In addition to Colin Kaepernick, sports figures like Eric Reed and LeBron James continue to use their platforms to address race relations in the United States. 
Grand Canyon University made coaching a little bit easier when they implemented technology that allows coaches to see real-time data for each of their players. Our Sydney Carter went out to learn more about the technology. Grand Canyon soccer players and their coaches know everything about their performance. Their top speeds, amount of impacts received, energy, and even their location on the field. And we can actually see that, oh, I feel tired, and then you see the data, and you're like, oh, this is because of this. And without it, it would be kind of difficult just put in to the trainer, like what she or he can do, you know? So it's more like we can take uh, care of our bodies ourselves. This is thanks to a wearable device called Player Tech. And what we're using for currently is pretty much like uh, monitoring player load to make sure that the players are not overworking, they're not underworking, but they're pretty much always staying in that range where science says that is the best range to stay within if you're not looking to increase injury risk. GCU soccer performance specialist Ben Panacasio looks at every player's statistics daily and makes changes to a player's workload accordingly. I think it's always nice to have another tool to present to coaches to give them some hard facts and data, but it's nice to have another metric to add to your perception moving forward and be able to deal with it. And so I think it served us really, really well in being able to manage the guys um, during the season. The athletes slip these devices into the back of their player tech shirts, and these GPS trackers make about 2,500 measurements per second. I think we're fresher going on the field. I think uh, we're able to understand uh, the workload that they put in. Maybe because we haven't had so many injuries, it's benefited us tremendously because coaches like myself who's been in this game for a long time before a program like a Catapult has come around, it was all just an eye. Vision is a memory of what we've seen in the past. GCU is currently leasing these devices in a three-year contract. In Phoenix, Sydney Carter, Cronkite News. The 2017-18 flu season broke records, hospitalizing 900,000 people. Reporter Ashley Mackey was in Tempe to see how ASU Athletics is combating flu season this time around. It's the start of fall, so while for some that may mean more pumpkin spice lattes or getting a head start on their holiday shopping, for athletes, it's a time to be more aware of their health. According to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, seasonal influenza activity, or flu season, begins around October and November, peaks between December and February, and can last as long as May. With the constant close contact ASU athletes experience on a day-to-day -day basis, awareness and precautions of the disease are in place, including flu vaccination. Oh, ASU does a really good job of making flu vaccinations available for everyone, whether it's staff, regular students, um, and we're no different. So we make it available for all the student athletes. Although the CDC identifies annual vaccinations as the best way to prevent flu, ASU Athletics does not mandate the shop for its students or staff. Instead, they offer alternative precautions. Other things like he offers vitamin C or um, healthy food habits or sleeping habits. And if you, he's not available to talk to, there's also other doctors and trainers who are willing at any time. And it seems like some prevention tips are already sinking in with the athletes. A lot of times we try to not share water bottles or not share food or forks, spoons, utensils, because that causes a lot of germs to be spread. We have a couple of people called germaphobes on our team who don't let that happened ever. The 2017-18 season was the first season to be classified by the CDC as a high severity across all age groups, something that coaches at ASU took notice of. I think you should be doing everything you can to, to prevent and stay safe and stay healthy, you know, especially right now that we are in the middle of the season. We don't want anybody sick. We don't want, you know, we want the whole team healthy. McCarty says there's things they can't control, like needing to all come to the same place every day, but they're working to manage what they can. In Tempe, Ashley Mackey, Cronkite News. With only about a month into this flu season, the Arizona Department of Health Services has already confirmed more than 170 cases. Voluntarily getting into a sub-zero temperature chamber after a tough workout might seem extreme, but that exact method is letting Phoenix Rising players avoid injury with USL playoffs approaching. Cronkite sports reporter Ricardo Avila gives us an inside look. Phoenix Rising is putting a spin on the term home field advantage, battling the extreme heat of Arizona summers with the extreme cold that comes with cryotherapy. I hate the cold, but 
This is a this is a very good process. It helps your body recover a lot faster than not doing it. It's three three and a half minutes of just sacrificing. If you get to those three and a half minutes, I bet you you'll feel ten times better after you're done with it. Feeling ten times better is what cryotherapy is all about. With their season lasting up to ten months and frequently playing in temperatures well above hundred degrees, players know recovery is key to their success. It's a great experience for us because it gives us the opportunity to recover to the best of our ability and so that we can perform at the highest level that we do. I'll just get in there, you'll be fine. Trust me, it's, it's, you'll feel great afterwards, so it's all worth it. Even though temperatures in the cryo chamber can drop to negative 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and some might see that as torture, it definitely has its benefits. And what we find is that we're able to get the guys back to 100% faster than when we were not doing cryo. And also, we're able to train at a higher level because um, their tank gets filled up or their energy gets filled up faster. Whole body therapy is essentially just for reducing inflammation, um, increasing range of motion, all those things. Because when you're practicing and playing games, uh, it's hard on your body. Your body's trying to recover. As Rising enters the final playoff push, the team remains hopeful of surpassing last year's first round elimination. In Scottsdale, Ricardo Avila, Cronkite News. The mountains surrounding the Phoenix metro area offer individuals the chance to escape concrete, but that doesn't necessarily mean other people. Despite over 200 plus miles of public trails for outdoorsmen to enjoy, population increase in the area is leading to crowded mountains and issues for users. Jake Tribolsky reports. As people continue to flock to Arizona's most crowded city, traffic is appearing in places without paved roads. We like to say that our trails are loved to death, and that really is true. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the Phoenix metropolitan area has grown about 13% since 2010. More people in the area means more people looking to enjoy the Phoenix outdoors. City trail counters tallied over 3,400,000 users in 2017. That's according to the City of Phoenix Parks and Recreation Department. Phoenix trails take such a beating, it makes it hard for city employees to keep up with. There's a lot of volunteer hours that we get every year, and we couldn't operate without that. In order to fight the decay of trails, groups such as the Gravity Riders Organization of Arizona promote trail advocacy. They frequently hold trail maintenance days to protect the land. As population increases, Maintaining existing trails is one issue. Keeping people on them is another. Sometimes we'll do an entire trail day that that's all we're doing is just cutting off shortcuts or repairing damage from people cutting around things. Wandering off the beaten path raises huge safety concerns. With unmarked trails, when a user becomes lost or injured, it becomes extremely difficult for rescue teams to find them. And the scary part is, a lot of people don't realize they're in an unsanctioned trail at all. One person going off trail Leaves a, leaves a path for others to follow. Once other people start following, that increases the trail, makes it more appealing to others to use, whether they know they're, they're doing it or not. The ecosystem is sensitive, and Gronseth says with users wandering off sanctioned trails, it could damage a landscape and pose threats to wildlife. In Phoenix, Jake Trybolski, Cronkite News. With the abundance of golf courses in Arizona, our Justin Parm found out how some golfers with disabilities are teeing off. Balance, center of gravity, and impact are all essential for a good golf sport. So the very first time I hit the ball, I crushed it. I, it was straight and far, and this dude just looked at me and was like, kind of like, nice work, you know? And I just, I, you know, I wish every single shot could have been my, as good as my first one. A good golf swing for players like Tim Serry requires more than just a good backswing and a steady grip. I got hurt in 1988 as a car wreck is what happened. Medically what happened is I ruptured my aorta and it killed my motor and sensory nerves. I remember being in the hospital and I remember looking around smelling all this great barbecue from my mouth wired shut and they set me a, a, a a shake, if you will. They ground up all the, the ribs and whatever, put it in there and set it in front of my, it, it right on my table. And right then and there, I knew if I've got to eat barbecue, drink it through a shake, I'm going to make it. Tim made it, but the recovery wasn't easy for someone who is used to being active. No way, I knew it. Sure, it sucked getting hurt and being in a wheelchair. I wasn't going to let it stop me. I was going to just go and go and go. 
And, and that's how I got through my rehab, and that's how I go through life. Determined to keep going, Tim started playing wheelchair sports, like track and field. In a 1992 meet, Tim took second place in shot put and discus. Now he also hits the links, thanks to the stand up and play golf cart, a piece of equipment that raises pair of athletes like Tim into a standing position. I've been playing golf for about three years now. Uh, the stand up and plays were introduced about three years ago. Got to go out and play with my buddies. And it was fun, just hanging out. Carry out on! There oh. being, it, being with your buddies again, and this one actually stands you up. You can look eye to eye. Just makes, makes, you, just makes you feel real, real good. While access to adaptive golf equipment has grown, buying that equipment isn't quite as easy. And it could require someone trading in their car, considering a stand up and play golf cart like this one could cost upwards of $35,000. To help make the equipment more accessible, Ability360 bought stand up and play golf carts and single rider golf carts. Use of both carts are included in Ability360's monthly membership fee of $35. When you're out on the golf course, you get it all the time. First of all, they come up and they see this machine that you're on, and they're like, what, what is that? Then they'll look, and they see it stand, standing you up. They're just like, holy moly. Then they see you hit the ball, and they're just like right on. It's just kind of neat to see those people realize that, hey, you know what, just because I'm in a wheelchair, just because I've got a disability something, I can still go out and play with the best of them. While the stand up and play car enables him to play golf, he said it doesn't give him an advantage over golfers without disabilities. Oh, come on. Just being competitive gives me a drive to go out and be better, even on a golf course, you know, play my lie or how I can get a roll onto the green, something like that. For a lot of people, that's why they love golf. It's the challenge, whether it's playing a shot from the bunker or trying to sink a long putt. Get in, get in, get in, get in. Oh. The challenge is universal. In Phoenix, Justin Parr, Cronkite Sports Report. Surrey isn't the only golfer using these adaptive carts. Members of Ability360 are encouraged to test out the equipment and hit the links.